Dr. Jones earned his PhD at NYU and he's currently an assistant professor of Spanish and Africana Studies at Bracknell University where he teaches courses on um, Miguel de Cervantes, the Renaissance and Baroque uh, theater, Afro-Hispanic and Black Atlantic literature, theory, and culture. And so his book that's uh, come out in hardback, it'll soon be out of paperback, um, is, uh, that I'll speak about today is Staging Aba de Negros, Radical Performances of the African Diaspora in Early Modern Spain. And so uh, Cassandra L. Smith describes this book as follows. A crucial intervention in discussions about black Africans in Renaissance Europe. Jones is careful against the grain readings, open up to readers new archives, and represent familiar ones from fresh, intriguing perspectives for the study of black cultural experiences in the Renaissance era. So among Professor Jones's other uh, very intriguing publications are the following. Um, a co-edited volume called Early Modern Black Diaspora Studies, a Critical Anthology. An essay called uh, Beyonce's Lemonade Folklore, Feminine Reverberations of Odu and Afro-Cuban Orisha iconography in the Lemonade Reader, Beyonce, Black Feminism and Spirituality. And one article that I've assigned um, is on his on the use of African inflected speech, and this will be what we'll talk about a bit today, in the work of the uh, Mexican poet, uh, Sor Juan Inés de la Cruz. And for other people who are like me, fans of Baroque Spanish poetry, he's also, also published a great article on articulating black beauty and humanity in the works of Luis de Gongora, who's one of the um, stars of the Spanish Baroque. Um, he's also co-editing another volume uh, entitled uh, Pornographic Sensibilities on the Culture of Sex in the Visceral and Imperial Spain by which is a lucky twist of fate. He's allowed some idiotic historian <laughs> sexuality <laughs> to who's uh, here to you to participate in. Um, yours truly. He's currently at work on two new book projects. One that examines the role of material culture in the literary production of black women in early modern Portugal and Spain, and another that uncovers the Holy Office of the Spanish Inquisition dossier of Catalina Muñoz. So I'm a big fan of Professor Jones, and I've been fortunate to be able to uh, intersect with him in various projects over the years, um, some of which I've mentioned. So let's please welcome this uh, distinguished visitor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and again. Many thanks to all the powers that be for bringing me here and um, organizing my visit and talk tonight or book presentation tonight. And thanks as well, Natalia, for organizing everything and all of your endless, tireless help. <clears throat> all righty. Um, so this afternoon, I will be speaking about my newly released monograph staging Habla de Negros, Radical Performances of the African Diaspora in Early Modern Spain. The book centers African diaspora cultural studies and early modern Spanish literature. It intends to explicate the need for a critical race analysis of white appropriations of black African voices in Spanish dramatic texts from the 1500s through 1700s, when the composition and performance of Africanized Castilian, commonly referred to as habla de negros, were in vogue. The use of black speech in Spanish literature goes part and parcel with this racialized construction of black Africans in early modern Spain. As linguist John Lipsky has argued in numerous studies, and I quote, black Spanish must be understood as a linguistic fabrication used as a comic device that is purely literary language, end quote. Comic in its objective with a bountiful representation of purely comical, burlesque, aesthetic and dramatic possibilities, Lipsky's reading of Africanized Castilian further maintains that its authors portray black characters as, quote, buffoons, mindless dancers, or simple victims of fate, end quote, whose habla de negro speech operates as a, as a, quote, exaggerated travesty, end quote. Andre Bello summarizes the scholarly interest in and conclusion of Africanized Castilian and Portuguese as follows, and I quote, Scholars help maintain the symbolic violence that was inherent in the use of such, of such a speech. It was a language made by white authors, dis destined to be heard and or read by a public dominated by white people and with an intention of mockery expressing a strong social and racial prejudice." End quote. My book posits an alternative interpretation of Habla de Negro speech events that disrupts the above mentioned critical reception bestowed on literary appropriations of Africanized Castilian. 
While acknowledging the compelling, the compelling research conducted by previous scholars, I aim to revise the dominant discourse they have established. My goal here is to highlight the agentive subject positions of Habla de Negro speecher, speakers and to examine their voices as possible discourses. The book sets into motion a new scholarly precedent and trend that will place at the forefront a paradigm shift for scholars of Iberian studies, Latin American studies, and African diaspora studies. Although some scholars will contend that it is impossible for any white author of Habla de Negros materials to engage in non-racist characterizations of their black literary creations, the close readings performed throughout staging Habla de Negros will suggest otherwise. Regardless of the ideologies espoused by these authors, I argue that their texts do, in fact, render legible the voices and experiences of black Africans in fundamental ways that demand our attention. Rodrigo de Reynosa's Gelofe Mandinga, a poem, direct, a poem directed specifically at the black population of Seville, highlights West African aesthetics and culinary practices. In Lope de Ruedas, Eufemia, Los Engañados, and Coloquio de Gila, the black women who populate these dramatic works, intercalated short skits, sass and subvert their interlocutors' racist and misogynist epithets. At the turn of the 17th century in 1602, uh, Simón Aguado's Entremes de los Negros stages the agentive voices of Dominga and Gaspar, who challenged their white masters by interrogating the institution of slavery and its infringement on the, mar on the marrying of black slaves. Aguado's play is also a foundational work in early modern Spanish theater studies, for it lays the groundwork for other Spanish authors such as Francisco Avellaneda in his Entre Mes de los Negros, 1622, and Francisco de Quevedo's Boda de Negros from 1643 to explore the theme of black weddings, nuptials, and sub-Saharan African musical traditions and dance in Spain. And even more fascinating are the ways in which practitioners of Habla de Negro speech forms link the language of African dances and music, which I do not treat entirely as a mockery nor an attempt to hypersexualize and denigrate blacks. Rather, when Spanish dramaturgs incorporate black dances and musical traditions, such as the guineo, gurumbe, paracumbe, sarabanda, and sarambeque, to just name several, into their plays, a new aesthetic and exploration of diasporic culture comes alive. If the first argument of staging Habla de Negros is to highlight the agentive subject positions of Habla de Negros speakers and literature, then the second argument of the book claims that black populations of early modern Iberia actively participated in the formation of a so-called black experience that thrived outside of Brazil, the Caribbean, and the United States. Historian James Sweet's pioneering book, Recreating Africa, Culture, Kinship, and Religion in the African Portuguese World, 1441 to 1770, has been instrumental, instrumental to my theoretical framing of the African diaspora in relation to early modern Iberia. What I have found compelling about his work in recreating Africa is its strength in stressing the centrality of the African past in African diaspora studies. Like Sweet, I also argue that that resistance among African slaves did not always manifest itself in the ways that scholars have typically understood their bondage and subordination. And by, no, and by no means do I fetishize black people's agency and resistance to oppression. Historically, in early modern Iberia, as well as in the variety of texts I examined throughout this book, black Africans and their descendants frequently addressed the institution of slavery and its attendant uncertainties and pressures with the most potent weapons at their disposal. Not muscle and might, but the materiality of clothing, food, hair, makeup, religion and spirituality, and song and dance. These performative embodiments of black expression are deeply embedded in Habla de Negro's speech, and I treat them as evidence for Africans addressing their condition. So this, uh, port this royal portrait that we have here um, by Cristóbal de, de Moraes um, represents or is a portrait of Juana um, de Austria, who was um, Carlos, um, Carlos V, Charles V. I'm like thinking in Spanish and in my head and translating into English. Um, his daughter. Um, and so with Juana, so this painting here 
represents Ahuana at the age of 18. And then also this is Philip II's sister um, in the genealogy of, the, of it all. So the black person here is a girl. Some, you know, suggest that it's a boy, but in the inventories and in various art work that has been done by art historians, um, it, we know, we have learned that this is um, a black girl, and she specified in Juana's 1574 inventory, again, where this portrait is carefully recorded. And the girl is a wedding gift from, from Juana's husband, Prince Joao. And with the color here, um, in many Renaissance Iberian, in Iberian courts during the Renaissance period, black was the favorite color, um, an ideal color um, that was worn in the courts. Often um, the aristocracy married in black as well. Um, and so enslaved blacks in these Renaissance portraits were added as visual foils to help emphasize the princely and aristocratic rank of the sitter. And this is the first time a black slave is shown juxtaposed with a royal sitter in a Portuguese court portrait. And with the uh, items here, you know, which, is, which is, creates an interesting material narrative um, where you have the fan imported from the Rikyu Islands of Japan, um, is understood to have been brought to Portugal from Japan in 1552. And then again, with this enslaved um, young girl represents Africa as well, Sub-Saharan Africa. And so um, this person here, again, representing Portuguese global dominion at the time in Sub-Saharan Africa, and the fan representing Portuguese dominion in the east, in the, in the far east. Necessary. So in, 14, in 1490, Fernando Silveira, court official and poet to King Joao II, poeticized the voice of an African king from Sierra Leone visiting Évora, Portugal. A mim rei do negro estar seja lua, longe muito terra onde viver nos, lodar caite bela tubal de Lisboa, falar muito nuvens que caçar pela voz, Querer a mim logo ver vos como vai, deixar mulher meu, partir muito sinha, porque sempre não servir vosso pai, fulgar muito negro estar vos a rainha, aqueste gente meu taibo, terra nossa nunca fulgua, andar sempre guerra, não saber que que balia terra vossa, balia que saber como nossa terra, se logo vos quer mandar a mim, venha, Fazer que, que saber, tomar que achar. Mandar fazer tai bom lugar, desmantenha. A logo meu negro, senhora Baliar. The African king's voice depicted in Silveira's 16 verse long poem was recited on November 30th, 1490 in Évora, Portugal in celebration of the wedding festiv festivities and marriage of Prince Fernando son of Joao II and inheritor of the Portuguese crown to Isabella, the daughter of the Catholic monarchs, Queen Isabel I of Castile and Ferdinand II of Aragon. Silveira's vocalization of the Sierra Leonean king voice, voice exemplifies the material and performative expression of African diasporic dance and music cataloged in Garcia de Recen's Cancioneiro Geral compiled around 1483 and printed in 1516. The Cancioneiro Geral introduces the theatricalized performance under the following title, Cudel mor por breve do rua morisca chatorta que mandou fazer a senhora princesa quando esposou. Recen describes the dance scene, or morisca retorta, as it is called in his 1545 Vida Efeitos, del rei Dum João Segundo, as follows. E houve aí uma muito grande representação de Dum rei de Guiné, em que vinha três gigantes espantosos que pareciam vivos, de mais de 40 palmos cada um, com ricos vestidos todos pintados de ouro, que parecia coisa muito rica, e com eles uma muito grande e rica morisca retorta em que vinham 200 manilhas, polos braços e pernas douradas que cuidavam 
que eram de ouro e cheios de cascavéis dourados e muito bem consertados, coisa muito bem feita e de muito custo por serem tantos, em que se gastou muita seda e ouro, e faziam tamanho roido como os muitos cascavéis que traziam que se não ouviam com eles. Each of these above cited passages from Resen's Cancionero Geral represents not only a mise en scène, but more interestingly, a black en scène, as a performance of blackness where the vernacular and the non textual carry pertinent meanings. Silveira's textual poet poeticizing of the Sierra Leonean king's African diasporic language and voice comes to life through dance, mediation, literariness. The textual presence of the African king's fala de preto speech, as it is enhanced theatrically by the Morisca Retorta dance, marshals on the one hand and, and renders legible on the other hand Mary Louise's, Mary Louise Pratt's term contact zone. I find Pratt's terminology apt for analyzing the Cancionero Geral's Luso African references because it illustrates an elite courtly space in which peoples geographically and historically separated come into contact with each other. And to be clear, I do not read Silveira's imagined African king as a powerless slave. Rather, I treat him as a sovereign dignitary. And I can get into the details of this in the Q&A, but um, that for me, this is very important, um, thinking again historically um, and really treading carefully when understanding and thinking about the power relations um, and the dynamics between African kings and European kings. And so in this period, you know, it's not in these very, you know, white over black binarized, white is more powerful than black enlightenment forms of thinking. We're in a world that is before the enlightenment, that is following um, canon law, Roman law, the kingdom of Congo, um, is understood and seen as a Christian, as a Catholic sovereign space. And so the power dynamics are very different in this realm that we're, you know, that I'm citing and working with. And more recently, a lot of this, you know, scholarship has been published recently in Herman Bennett's new book, um, African Kings and Black Slaves. Sovereignty and Dispossession in the Early Modern Atlantic. And in that book, he does a very meticulous, rigorous job of yeah, laying out all of the, you know, these types of um, examples and dynamics as well as, as, well as others. <clears throat> By the late 1400s, for example, um, interaction between Iberians and Sub-Saharan Africans on the Upper Guinea coast maintained their interaction and spurred the formation of a creolized Luso-African society. As the Atlantic historian David Weed explains, and I quote, Iberian clergymen visited the rivers of Guinea as missionaries and diplomats, and Portuguese and Luso-African traders integrated themselves into commercial networks geared toward regional exchange rather than large-scale large slave production along, all along the Upper Guinea coast, end quote. And continuing with wheat, he also explains and elaborates, as late as the 1630s, Iberian merchants' acquisition of Upper Guinean captives for export remained merely one element in a broader system of trade that included the extensive participation of Luso-Africans and, and Africans of diverse status and the exchange of European commodities alongside local products such as millet and beeswax, end quote. Pratt's or Mary Louise Pratt's contact zone theory suitably encapsulates my discussion of Silveira's and Resen's above quotes insofar as the contact zone attempts to invoke spatial and temporal co-presence of subjects previously separated by geographic and historical disjunctures in whose trajectories now intersect. Even the materiality of the dance troops clothing and dress Sub-Saharan African gold, bangles and bells, harmonized with the evocation of a morisca retorta, or the Moorishness of silk fabric, 
which also vividly characterizes Pratt's contact zone paradigm. A contact perspective is productive for my analysis of the Cancionero Geral's image of Africanized Portuguese language and West African dance because it treats the relations among black Africans and Iberians, in the case of the court of Joao II, in terms of co-presence, interaction, interlocking understandings and practices, often within radically asymmetrical relations of power. Silveira's lyrics also attest to the voyages of Vasco da Gama to the African continent, where the opening line, Amin Khe, or I am the black king of Sierra Leone, captures the language of a king from Sierra Leone, or in this region of the rivers of, of Guinea, as it was understood at the time. And he, fra he frames the royal figures Africanized Portuguese in the chronicles of Gaspar Correa and the voyages of, of Vasco da Gama. And Lipsky confirms, the, the, the linguist John Lipsky confirms that Silveira, and I quote, provides a realistic sample of what the first groping linguistic contacts between Africans and Portuguese speakers must have been like, end quote. And in the context of black Africans, enslaved and free, the proliferation of the Africanized languages they spoke on Iberian soil, Resen's profound knowledge and thorough study of blacks in early modern Portugal must not go unnoticed. And for example, in Resen's Cronica de Rey Dom Joao II informs us that by the end of the 15th century, 18,000 black and Iberian Muslim slaves constituted 16% of the population in Évora. At the time, the second largest city in Portugal, capital of the Alentejo uh, region, and also preferred residence of the later kings of the dynasty of Avis and the location of Silveira's above-cited poem. The legacy and ligature of Resen's documentation of Africanized Portuguese carries over into Renaissance Castilian court poetry. The earliest and most concrete example of Spain's inheritance of African diasporic language from Portugal occurs at the turn of the 16th century, thus inaugurating the birth of literary Hispanic habla de negros. Between 1516 and 1524, a Montañez poet from the highlands of Cantabria by the name of Rodrigo de Reynosa, a contemporary of Garcia de Resen, composed the habla de negros poems Gelofe Mandinga and Mangana Mangana. A third poem attributed to Reynosa, titled Canta Jorjico Canta, does not use Africanized Castilian entirely, but is, of, but is often cataloged in Reynosa's corpus of Hable de Negros poetry. A pioneer in the cultivation of Hable de Negros in Germania, which was the language of street thugs and rogues and swindlers. Reynosa also specialized in the literary representation of, of other speech forms characteristic of Renaissance Spain's urban underworld, that of ruffians, or rufianes, prostitutes, rameras, celestinesque uh, figures referred to as alcahuetas and comadres, and shepherds or pastores from the countryside. Reynosa textual criticism has viewed the poet as perpetuating racist stereotypes that debase and deride blacks. I'm not convinced of such claims. In Reynosa's depiction of these various marginal groups and their linguistic variations, he, in fact, disrupts social and cultural boundaries while arguably reinforcing them. But furthermore, the poet ruptures sociocultural and racial boundaries along the lines of the visual, of the visual social class, and space. The poem Gelofe Mandinga, for example, captures profoundly and vivid, vividly the naughty tug of war tug of war struggle between reconciling the racist stereotyping of black Africans and their empowerment. While at first glance, Reynosa's rep representation of Habla de Negros is difficult to decipher, his exploration of Africanity and black sub subjectivity is nuanced and sophisticated. Africanity is a term that I elect in order to furnish a critical vocabulary for scholars, students, and general readers of Reynosa's Gelofe Mandinga. The concept and notion of Africanity and Reynosa marks visible for my audience what has been rendered invisible, characteristics of sub-Saharan African culture and expression. Gelofe Mandinga mediates a larger didactic conversation about the diversity of West African customs and culinary habits whose virtues illustrative of Africanity will shed light on Reynosa's 
rich cartographical and material indexing of West African goods in objects that describe foods associated with the quotidian life unique to many West African ethnicities and nations. For Reynosa, Africa, or Guinea, as understood by his Iberian audience, as a geographic location and, con and concept is not an abstraction. I repositioned him as an early modern Castilian writer aware of West Africa and West African culture. So who does Reynosa's position as cultural, cultural and linguistic mediator demonstrate Africanity? I argue henceforth that Reynosa exposes his audience to West African customs and food culture through characteristics of black expression, such as the verbal act of signifying. The exact definition of signifying is contested because it is used to refer to so many communicative phenomena, from tongue-in-cheek response, from tongue-in-cheek reference to prior speakers and writers to playfully insulting to playfully insulting a conversational adversary. Signifier refers to one, the playful insulting of an adversary, and two, an indirect method of communication whereby the only intended audience will be able to recognize and decode. Other tactics such as rhyming, mimicry, call and response, also known as antiphony, repetition, teasing and shouting out one's name or shouting out another phrase cannot be overlooked in our analysis of the role of signifying in Gelofe Mandinga. The effect of signifying is that, un that unfamiliar listeners mistake or fail to grasp the full significance of the communication. Komba, or the two protagonists in the poems that I'm about to cite in a, in a few seconds, Komba and Jorge's signifying speech acts show that the intended audience, and again, this is very important to this piece because in the um, woodcut that accompanies um, this poem, it says explicitly that these couplets are dedicated and written for the black men and black women who who live in Seville. And so for me, that's you know extremely important. And many um, philologists and, and historians and literary critics have overlooked that detail that, again, Reynosa is public, you know, he wrote and composed these couplets with the black community um, of Seville in mind, and so, and, and, and I can get into this in the Q&A, and that all in that black community is also Reynosa's audience. It's not an invisible, you know, black audience, or, you know, his audience isn't just um, whites, for, you know, a lack of a more descript term. So in this poem, in the Gelofe Mandinga, with signifying and where this act, these signifying acts uh, manifest, we have this female protagonist by the name of Komba, and so she instigates this first, the first signifying act in the poem. And so Komba, she slams Jorge, her, the other interlocutor um, figure character in the poem, with insults by asserting her name and lineage. lineage. And in these translations, she says that you know, my name is Komba and I'm from Guinea. My land is Guinea. After, Com after Jorge insults her with this very obscene, um, visceral epithet. And in the Spanish, or in the Habla de Negros, it, it reads as Doña Puta Negra Caravallenta. <laughs> and so for those of you familiar with the Spanish, you can piece together, you know, the, the obscenity and the explicitness. <laughs> the X-ratedness of this text with rhyming. And so rhyming as another signature feature of signifying as it manifests in this poem is of, extra is of extraordinary importance to the production of the poem's humorous effect. Their rhyme scheme in, the rhyme scheme in the poem enhances the signifying moment by the poem's musicality and witty delivery. Coupled with rhyming and metric form, insulting throughout these throughout these the two stanzas show shows how Comba and Jorge signify. The wide array of insults tossed between the two is in, is astonishing. Comba Comba's attacks, as they are designed and mediated by Reynosa against Jorge's home of origin, culinary customs, and dietary habits, conflate race with nation. And so. 
to summarize what happens in, in, in the poem, the two, Combe and Jorge, use specific um, food items and food practices to, to insult one another. And so for Comba, who is aligned or identified and aligned with Guinea or the Senegambia region, um, and also not being Christian or, or not being Muslim as well, because in the poem, Jorge uses his, is him, him, himself being a Muslim to be better to her, to be superior to Comba. Um, you have this back and forth with food. So Jorge insults Comba by saying, you know, you're in your trashy, shitty land of Guinea or wherever, which is what he says, you know, you guys eat, you know, rotten dog heads, so on and so forth. And then she responds and says, you know, oh, you think you're, you know, all that, you think that you're better. Well, then no, and you know, where you're from, and she doesn't even name where he's from, she scoffs and she uses in Spanish the subjunctive mood um, to have this emotive, aff affective response where, you know, wherever the hell it is you're from in Africa, you guys, you know, eat, you know, X, Y, and Z. <clears throat> And so what's really fascinating, you know, in this poem is that through with through ethnonyms and specifically with Reynosa, he's using very accurately um, ethnonyms to identify and to construct food specific West African food practices, um, cultural habits, um, so on and so forth. To speed up a bit, um, dances. And so for the Sabla de Negros, which is one of the highlights of you know writing this book, was getting into the dances and linking dance culture and the dance culture that was very active and alive in, in Renaissance and Baroque Spain. And so thinking about these physical embodiments and so how Habla de Negros also manifests physical embodiment through black dances. And so in Quevedo's Primatica del Tiempo, Quevedo, a famous Baroque satirist in the 17th century, berates black African slave culture flourishing on Spanish soil. And what he denigrates in particular is this dance called the Guineo, a West African dance known for its quick and brisk movements. And in his words, he scoffs, and I'll cite the original Spanish and give the English translation. Item, vista la ridícula figura de los criados cuando dan a beber a sus señores, haciendo el coliseo, el Guineo, inclinando con notable peligro y asco de todo el cuerpo demasiado y que, siendo mudos de boca, son habladores de pies de puro hacer desairadas reverencias. Declaramos sea eso tenido por descortesía e reverencia. In the translation, Item, given the ridiculous figure of the servants when they serve drinks to their masters, dancing the Coliseo and the Guineo, hunching their whole body over in a, in a notably dangerous and disgusting manner, and that, being mute of mouth, they are chatterboxes with their feet from making so many unattractive reverences. We declare this to be discourteous and irreverent. As if he were peering in on a masquerade ball or party, Quevedo's satiric commentary in this passage, as well, in, as, well as in the rest of the Prematica, possesses an ethnographic and folkloric flavor, transporting us to some kind of ritual or folkloric performance, yet also legalistic and inquisitorial, hence the repetition of item throughout the treatise, Quevedo conjures an imagery of a deformed and grotesque black body, qua coliseo or culiseo, and the word culo derived from ass, guineo, which is this um, African dance, West African dance, and then the habla, then it's compacted with habla de negros or references to this Africanized Castilian with, with respect to it being a speech impediment and where he says mudos de boca or mute of mouth. 
Quevedo's remark, they are chatterboxes with their feet, also stems from a larger cultural legacy and history of West Central African dances, such as the Chacona, Guineo, Parucumbe, Sarabanda, and Sarambeque, among many others, that traveled to and from the continent of Africa, the Spanish Caribbean, and the Iberian Peninsula. To acquire a fuller understanding of black dances in early modern Spain, we must go back to early modern continental Africa and colonial Cuba in order to trace these dances transatlantic maritime journey to Spanish shores. Dance historian and flamenco scholar Jose Luis Navarro Garcia in his Historia del Valle Flamenco explains the indelible imprint of sub-Saharan African dances on Iberian soil. He is the first scholar, to my knowledge, who links sub-Saharan African dances, music, drumming styles, and ceremonial rituals coming from early colonial Cuba to early modern Spain well into the 18th and 19th centuries. Navarro Garcia explains that a variety of dances, songs, and rhythms crossed the Atlantic from Havana brought by mariners and other travelers arriving to the ports of Cadiz and Seville. In Seville, for instance, census reports and ecclesiastic records document the large presence of blacks and mulatos in attendance of and, and participation in Corpus Christi processions that welcomed the Catholic monarch's arrival to the gate of Macarena on July 24, 1477. Twenty years later, on June 27, 1497, for instance, Queen Isabella's appearance at Seville's Corpus Christi festivities that summer, the city issued an order requesting that, and I quote from the original ordinance, all blacks in the city uh, participate in celebrating the Catholic monarch's arrival. And this civic gesture in the historical archive of including and signaling all blacks in Seville to partake in Sevillano citizenry repeats itself in the fi early 1500s in Rodrigo de Reynosa's literary archive of this Gelofe Mandinga, and again circling back to the woodcut where uh, Reynosa explicitly writes, these couplets are dedicated to, intended for, the black men and black women of Seville. In the, munici in the municipal archive of Jerez de la Frontera in Cadiz, complaints circulated in response to predominantly black parties or fiestas where black and white slave fandangueros or party goers caused a lot of ruckus with their tambourines, uh, barrel drums, and other instruments. And to wrap up and to conclude, for the sake of time, I'm going to close up with two um, clips to give you a sense um, so to connect this early modern past with our present times, to get a sense of how in popular culture, uh, as well as in musicology, ethnomusicology, theater studies, um, classical music, these themes of habla de negros, black dances, performance are treated. And for me, what's really important is that there's no blackface. And again, in the q and I can elaborate in, in get into more details about these topics. Ooh, yeah. Okay, yeah, so I'll, I'll end it with that so we can go for the sake of time.